Welcome back to the Roraima Hour. My name is Jerry Gavaya Jr. and I'm going to be your host once again. Um, here with me in the studio, we have with us again Mr. Patrick Triumph. Again, if you guys don't remember, he is the manager at Duke Lodge here in uh, Georgetown, Kingston. And with us tonight, we have a very special guest, Captain Gerald Gavaya himself. Um, and he's going to be here, also known as my father. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to be with us and he's going to be sharing some, some deep insights into some of his experiences growing up here in Guyana. And then also here we have with us Captain Miles Williams and he is joining us from um, the States on Skype. So we're using technology uh, to, to, to communicate with him. So Captain Williams, can you say hi to the audience please? Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, as you guys can see, we have two legends in Guyana's aviation, and even this in Guyana's history here with us tonight. So, we're going to get a very special insight into, you know, what does it really mean to be a Guyanese citizen? Because these two men have been involved in the entire history, and I think it's very appropriate that with the inauguration of President Granger uh, tomorrow on our independence, these two gentlemen are going to share with us a little bit of Guyana's independence history and how Ghana moved from a uh, British colony into what we are today and they're gonna they're gonna show us something and tell us some stories about things that some of us have only read in, in, in the textbooks and these men lived it so Captain Gavaya <laughs> thank you very much um, but I think particularly um, our our involvement with with independence um, in, in, a, in a significant way um, happened on the 30th anniversary of our independence, that was in 1996. Um, but my, also my, my fascination with independence went back to 1996, in fact, when, to, to, to 1966, in fact, when I was a, a very young man, and um, I remember I lived in Lodge, and I was listening to the radio, and um, at the time the army had gone to Mount Angana, and um, they were raising the flag on Mount Angana, at the same time that they were uh, lowering, they were lowering the the Union Jack here in 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 Georgetown and raising the golden arrow head. And I remember that Colonel Desmond Roberts had the honor of um, of hoisting that flag here at, Nash at the National Park. But particularly, what I remember most significant was the soldiers who were on Mount Mount Angana. Were they they were transmitting back to the city via the HF radio and they were broadcasting that transmission live on national radio. And I was listening to the soldiers um, talk about being on Mount Aingana and that fact that they were raising the flag on Mount Aingana at the same time that it was happening here in the city. And I remember growing up always fascinated with, with being a soldier and, and how and what an honor it was to wear the uniform of a soldier and to do great things like that for your country. Um, and I remember always, in fact, um, always uh, thinking about Colonel Desmond Roberts at the time he was a lieutenant, and but how how honoured he was to have done what he was doing, and then fast forward me now to um, to my life as a young army officer. When I remember the first time that I became a, a, an army officer, and I put on that uniform, putting on the army uniform, and 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 just. It was an amazing experience. You felt invincible. I think there was a movie like that where somebody put on a suit and they felt with Jackie Chan, and they <laughs> right, right. And and when, but when you put on the you put on the, the army uniform, the Ghana Defense Force, 
um, it was such an honor and it humbled you, but it was you and some young men from here tonight to Nancy and was telling me that their their ambition is, is to join the army and I encourage them. The experience is amazing. And so when I, I had just come back home from university and uh, we had a pilot um, and an aircraft that disappeared. They were flying from Anna Regina to Mount Roraima to take some people to have a look at Mount Roraima as a tourism flight. And the pilot, his name was Henry Fitt, and the plane disappeared. And so a search and rescue was launched to look for this pilot. And they draw a line between Anna Regina and, and Mount Roraima. And um, they, every pilot had a, 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 a section either side of that line to search. And my search area happened to be Mount Roraima. Now I've never gone to Mount Roraima, but I always was fascinated with the song, Born in the Land of the Mighty Roraima. And the legend of this song and, and, and all the magical things with Mount Roraima. So I, I remember flying the day, and it was a very bad weather. Uh, the weather was very bad that afternoon. And we flew from Tamiri Airport at the time, and I got over to Mount, Mount Roraima. It was an hour and a half flight. And um, when I got over the mountain, I couldn't see the mountain. The mountain was covered in clouds. The mountain is 9,094 feet. This mountain is fascinating. At the time, I didn't know yet. So I couldn't land at the mountain. I think we have, if, and if you on the screen, there's a video of the kind of um, weather that we were seeing over the mountain that day. And this is just, this is a, another flight, but it's kind of what you see when you overhead Mount Roraima that, that day, and we couldn't see the mountain. And so I landed at a, at a small airport um, called Philippi, which is about 25 miles east of, of Mount Roraima, and we stayed there the night, and the next morning we took off um, to go back to start the search. And the morning when I took off, uh, there was a low cloud cover, broke through the clouds and turned to the west, and there was Mount Roraima. It was the most fascinating sight, and there's a, a video um, of that mountain, I think if you could play it there, so you'll see the, 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 the Mount Roraima. As I took off and I started to fly towards the mountain, and the mountain, I, I took the elevation was like maybe 2,000 feet, 1,500 feet. This mountain is 9,094 feet. So as I started to climb towards this mountain, and you see this gigantic mountain, it looks like the Titanic. And I flew closer and closer to this mountain, and I feel a little bad today because I, I remember being so fascinated with this mountain that for a few minutes I got lost in the in the magical sight of Mount Roraima, with these waterfalls uh, falling off the sides of the mountain, and I, I and I did not pay attention as much to the search and rescue um, that I was meant to be doing. So for a good 10-15 minutes, as I got over this mountain, and you see if you look on the screen, there's a it's amazing as you get close and close to that mountain, and you you understand this mountain, the rocks in this mountain is 2.5. A billion years old. The rocks in this mountain is more is is, is older than life itself, and um, and over the years the rains and the winds have carved have carved the rocks on the top of this mountain and, and made them into into shapes of children and churches and chess pieces. It's, but I didn't know that at the time. So I'm, I flew over this mountain and I got closer and closer to this mountain. And I started to look at the surface of this mountain. It looked like something from another world. It actually looked like, um, like, like, like the moon. And as you get closer, you will see it here. Uh, this, we, we actually do a lot of tourism flights to Mount Roraima now where we fly people from Ogle or Timur. We fly them over Mount Roraima like this. Um, and then we take them to Orinduk Falls and then to Kaichu Falls and bring them back home. But this is one of those, of, of those flights that, that I just did over Mount Roraima. But this is what I was seeing um, close to 40 years ago. And as I got over that mountain, I flew, we searched, we looked for the, for the young pilot and we couldn't find him. But I remember um, feeling very sad about the pilot, but as I turned away from that mountain that afternoon to start to, to come back, I said to myself, you know, if I ever form my own company, it will be named Roraima. I really didn't know what the company will be. It could be Roraima Construction, Roraima Shoemaking, whatever it was, but I knew that it will be Roraima. Um, and um, and so I left, I went back, my life in the army consumed me for the next 15 years, I never thought about it again. And then when, my, when, I, when, it, when the time came and I was in fact going to start my own company, it, it, was, it was easy. Um, 
Roraima Airways was um, magical and was born, and, and, and the name Roraima stuck. And so that is the story behind our fascination. I always said too, you know, I would love to be able to walk on the surface of that mountain one day. Because the mountain is 25 square miles. 10% um, is owned by Brazil, 25% uh, by Ghana, and 65% by, by Venezuela. Well, unfortunately, the Venezuelans like to believe the mountain, the whole mountain belongs to them. Well, 25% of that mountain belongs to us. And the most beautiful part of that mountain, in fact, the prow of the mountain belongs to Guyana. And, but the Venezuelan, they have a, 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 on their side, you could actually walk up. It takes about five days to get to the top. We, unfortunately, it's a straight, it's a straight cliff. And to get to the mountain, you have to be a real uh, uh, hard adventure mountain climber to get to the top. So, but I always thought that one day I'd love to get to the top of this mountain. Um, but um, I will come to these pictures in a moment because these, these are all very important pictures. But, so we were back now in 1996 and the country for some reason was going through, a, it was the 30th anniversary of our independence, the country was going through a very low ebb and morale was very low and the, and the rotary, the rotary of Georgetown um, decided that they were going to have this big um, uh, strategy called HUG. So people from across Guyana, from Skeldon to Parika to Linden to Let, everybody would get out on the street at 10 o'clock on Independence Day and everybody would join hands as a show of national unity. I mean, and it's actually quite coincidental that now this is, the, this is really the slogan of what is happening here at our 49th anniversary, the whole slogan of national unity. Um, and so while they were doing that, and then the GDF, Every year for a national independence, the GDF would normally send a contingent to back to Mount Ayangana to plant the flag of Guyana. And that year the weather was very bad and we got word that the GDF had cancelled the flag raising on Mount, on Mount Ayangana that, that year. And I knew for sure that no Guyanese had ever stepped foot on, on the mountain. I know that we had British climbers that went to the mountain, but there was no marking of Guyana on that mountain as far as I knew. So when I got word that they, that they had canceled the flag raising in Mount Ayangana, I met with my senior staff, which included Miles Williams. Uh, Miles was my chief pilot at the time. In fact, I know he was still in the army, if I remember correctly. Yes, and um, yes. he was still in the army, but he was always a good friend. He was, he, he, he was one of my pilots when I was the chief pilot in the army. So we sat in my, at, at, in my living room that night, uh, one week before independence, and we said, and I said to him, you know, Miles, let's go and plant the flag of Guyana on Mount Roraima. And he said, oh, you're crazy. And, I, and, and my wife was there, Debbie, and, and so on. And immediately we started the plan. How are we going to plant this flag? And we wanted to, we wanted to duplicate what happened in 1996. Um, 1966. 1966. Yeah. But we wanted to do it now with some technology. Yeah. So we had a very short period of time. This expedition was going to cost us about 25,000 US dollars. So I put out a call to the private sector and the private sector came in very generously and started to support this expedition. People were calling in from, um, from the, the grocery stores to give us groceries and, and people from adventure stores were calling in to give us adventure tents and all kinds of things and so on. And I wanted so bad from Miles because I needed somebody to go with me. But Miles couldn't get permission from the army. The army would not give him permission to go. Um, <laughs> But Miles was defiant, and he decided he was going to go with me anyway, secretly. In retrospect, so. <laughs> yeah, in retrospect. And, um, but anyway, so we started planning to get this thing. And the idea was independence was going to fall on the Sunday. The 26th was a Sunday of that year. And so we had to get to Mount Oraima. We wanted to go in maybe on the 24th, so that we could settle in on top of the mountain and then be able to plant the flag on the night of the, of the, the, the in the midnight, yeah. so we could then link up back with, with what was happening in the city and kind of duplicate what happened. And um, I remember that at the time, President Charlie Jagan became the patron for this for this the patron for this ex expedition. And um, uh, Desmond Hoyt joined, and he was very supportive. We had the entire private sector. We had all the education systems because we started to. It became a motivating factor across the country for school mm -hmm. children and so on. And um, the idea was that we were going to, we didn't have the time to go walking, so we had to do it 
high tech. So what we did is that we flew my planes and we went to the little runway which was uh, east of Mount Lorima called Philippi and we set up a base station there. And myself and Miles, the idea was that we're then going to go with, with our helicopter pilot going Sandiford and he's actually a, a with us, was, he was with, in the army with us. He's an amazing helicopter pilot. And so the idea was that we were going to fly to Mount Rima on the Friday, a flight to Philippi on Friday, settle in, and then we had to prod the mountain because what was happening, you could only get in either early in the morning or late in the afternoon because the weather is always bad at the mountain. So Miles and I, um, we got there, we had the police, we had a doctor, we had a team, and we set up a base station on, 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 on Philippi, got the village involved in this whole thing. We had, we had a, a big practice of the hug and on, uh, with, with the villages of Philippi. And um, so we had a big send off with Ogle that day. We had President Jagan, Mr., uh, uh, Mrs. Jagan was there, President Height was there. Uh, we had all the private sector, and it was a massive send-off. Miles, we are going down memory lane here. Do you remember those days? Oh yes, of course. <laughs> it's quite interesting. I mean, um, when we um, landed in Philippine, the excitement was just through the roof. I mean, we were both crazy thinking that we could do it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we eventually uh, we did it with you know with ease. A lot of precision. So we we settled in that day. And um, then we, we took an airplane and we, we started to send the airplane to do reconnaissance to the mountain to see when the weather would clear. And finally, after two or three times, the weather cleared and we took off with the helicopter. And Miles and myself, the pilot, and um, we got to the mountain and the place where we wanted to land, um, the weather started closing in the area, so we couldn't land in, on, on, in that area. So the pilot saw a clearing on one side and he, he just landed and put us down. And I remember all the pilots, and that day all the pilots in the sky was, was communicating with the helicopter. And um, there was this big excitement whether we would land or we couldn't land. And then finally, when, um, when the helicopter touched down, there was this echo across the skies of Guyana. The eagle has landed <laughs> on, on Mount Doraima. And um, so we landed. We, we, and Miles will, 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 will testify to this. The mountain was covered in clouds. From the time the helicopter landed and put us off and took off, we basically had to stay connected with each other by tying a rope to each other. Because when the, when the clouds come in, you could actually lose each other on, on, on these rocks in this mountain because it's a maze of rocks. And um, we got in there, Miles, just before dark that afternoon, right? Yes. but. What struck me though is when um, we had to drag out 200 pounds of food stuff off the helicopter and the helicopter disappeared and what struck me is how quiet it was up there. It was just absolutely quiet and cold. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really was. Yeah. We were on a different planet. Yeah. And so when we landed now, we, we drag ourselves because when we did the research on Mount, on Mount Roraima, Mount Roraima, there's a lot of crevices where there are like two or 3,000 foot crevices where the rocks separate and then the grass will grow and connect the rocks. So if you're not careful how you're walking, you could actually slip through on one of those crevices. And then there were flash floods. A lot of times when the rain falls in the high ground on the mountain, there, there would be rushing water would come and wash you your tent right off the mountain. So we had to be very careful and strategic of how we position our tent and how we moved and so on and so on. And um, so when we settled in, I was able now to call um, on the sat phone. I called back Debbie, my wife Debbie, who was actually, um, who was actually, hold on a minute, who was actually um, manning the position in, in Georgetown. And I called her and I said, listen, we didn't get to land where we wanted to land, but I gave her the coordinates where we landed. And she said, hold a minute, I'll tell you exactly where you are. And she came back like 30 seconds. I said, you're like two miles inside of Venezuela. Get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> so myself and Miles had to be fetching this 200 pounds of, of food stuff and bags that we had to try to get ourselves back into Guyana territory. We're not sure, Miles, whether we did, in fact, land on Guyana territory that night or slept in Guyana territory that night. But um, we... Um, we actually put up our tent and buckle along that night. And then the next day is when we went looking for the... And this, this video will show you some of it now. All right. Um, yeah.
So the next day now we are on the mountain and unfortunately you don't see Miles because Miles was always behind the camera. <laughs> and um, and it looked like if I was there alone, but I could not have done this without Miles. He was motivating, he was inspiring, and we were walking really in in in, in strange and magnificent territory. And um, we would walk for hours and hours trying to find. There's a trilateral marker where Guyana, Venezuela, and Brazil meet on this mountain, and there's a tri a white. Uh, concrete trilateral marker that we were looking for because we wanted to get there to plant the Guyana flag. This is where we, we, we um, our tent was the night to protect us away from the from the elements. This is what the rain would do to the rocks, and you see the rocks where the rains and the winds carved these rocks into an amazing, amazing shapes over the years. So Mount Rhyme is a fascinating uh, piece of God's work. It's 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 just uh, mind-boggling. And so we walked that day, and at the time when I really got tired, then we walked into this valley, and this became a valley of crystals. If you look at the ground below my feet, it looked like diamonds. There were millions and millions of quartz crystals that we built, and it was. We, we were not sure. We thought we stopped. We stri we stri <laughs> 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 That's right. That's right. That's right. And you see, you see the shapes of how the how the rocks are. Look, if you look at it, this this is this is how it is naturally. This is what the winds and the rains would have done. I mean, it sh faces of people and ships and and so on. And we walked and we walked and then finally I, I really started to give up. I was thinking, my God, this is tired. And then Miles said, Look up in the distance. If you look in the distance now, Miles, remember this? Oh, yeah. I, you're not seeing it, are you? Um, I can't see it. Right, 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 right. This is when Miles looked up and he said, Jerry, look up in the distance. There is a child. Well, there's a strange thing looking back at us. <laughs> and as we got closer, then we recognized that this was the trilateral marker. But this was, we walked for, for hours to get here. And Miles, remember that, that, that when we approached this trilateral marker for the first time? Yes, I do. Yeah. You know, we also did something, we were going to plant the flag, and we also took a plaque on this mountain which we were going to hide. And the Tourism Association at the time, Sean McGrath was the president of the Tourism Association. Uh, Jerry, pa pause this for a second. Uh, pause it right here for a second. This here, this is the trilateral marker. This side of it is the Venezuelan side. And it's very beautiful. They have Venezuelan the name, and they have the plaque. And what really annoyed me, is when I got from the, the Brazilian side, they also had Brazil marked in the trilateral mark. When I got to the Guyana side, play the video, I was really annoyed because somebody, some wicked person went up there and, and ripped the Guyana plaque from this trilateral marker. And so there's no, there was no indication of Guyana's um, uh, ownership of part of this mountain. And all I had with me, I mean, this was, see Brazil, they, they, they use the crystals and the, I know. You see, there's nothing <laughs> for Guyana there. Somebody took it off. So I had all I had was a chisel, and I chiseled the name Guyana, May 26, 1966. And I'm 1996. saying 1996. And I'm saying that for our 50th anniversary, we we have to go back there. If I don't go, the GDF should go and put the Guyana plaque back on that trilateral marker. 50th anniversary. You know, this is indeed incredible, you know, Captain. Uh, you've spoken and I've listened to you quite keenly. But what you have done here is give us a clear perspective of the independence history of Guyana. Um, we are really fortunate. I think um, those who are listening, they are truly fortunate to have listened to this. These are information that you wouldn't be able to find in a textbook. This is actual information given by someone who have been there and done that. And I want to commend you, Captain, on this. Um, of course, independence is a very interesting time in a company, in a country's history, right? When we are, we, we are gain independence from the colonial days, and there are lots of challenges that we face. So what you have done, basically, is to bring that will uh, of nation building that's correct into 
this whole perspective, right? The symbology yeah. of of independence. Um, it is so. It was so important and so inspiring. And the night I remember when we finally got to the point because we had to know we were trying to link up with the flag raising in the city and the flag raising on, on, on Mount Paraima. And so um, the rain was very, it was raining very badly at night. So they moved the, the flag raising from the National Park and it was happening at the Culture Center here. And we had a satellite phone. So what I did was I called from the mountain to my office to my wife, Debbie. And then she called Mani Ram Pashad, who was the chairman of the Private Sector Commission at the time, who was standing next to President um, Jagan. And, and then he gave President Jagan the phone. And he and I had this conversation in front of all the cameras. And that conversation was also broadcast live across the nation to say that at the same time we, were, we, were, we, were, we had just raised the flag in the city, the flag on Mount Oraima was raised. And so play the video there, Jerry. The anniversary of independence. We also put the flag of Mount Pride. Proud moment of independence. Proud moment of independence. To plant our flag on Mount Pride. It took me 15 years to come back here. Mr. President, this is Captain Gavaya. Yes, Captain Gavaya. Mr. President, I have just raised the flag of Mount Pride. And this was a moment, I believe, that was quite fascinating um, because it recreated 1966 from Mount Aingana on that HF radio, and this time we were doing it by the satellites. And um, we, Miles, um, no, hold, hold a minute. Miles, um, would you like to, to reflect on any of your own memories from that night? Oh, yes. Um, I felt so proud. I, I always wanted to go to Mount Oraima, uh, being a pilot in Guyana and seeing it every time I go to Imbamadai. Um, and I became very proud that night, standing next to you in front of uh, the, the uh, camera, filming everything that was going on. And uh, made me a very proud Guyanese. I, I saw I saw I saw you that night but you couldn't see yourself you were, you, you, you started to tear up you know he's he, he Miles grew up in the jungle um, with his family and so um, his, his father is a very famous um, Guyanese would you like to tell us here about your father Miles oh yeah my dad is uh, Dennis Williams um, famous archaeologist anthropologist um, he died of uh, that he left us in 1998 a very famous Guyanese. And so Miles was very emotional that night. I, I can imagine um, the, the level of emotionality that prevailed at that time, Miles. And I'm sorry we didn't have, I'm sorry we didn't have, um, we didn't have a tripod so Miles could be on the other side of the camera, but of course he, yes. he also didn't have permission from the GDF at the time, so we couldn't put him in front of the camera. So he was clandestine in his total support, but it was a dream for both of us to be walking on the surface of Mount, of Mount Torema. Uh, well, well, Captain, um, even though you may not have gotten permission, I think what he did was quite noble and honorable. Oh, it was amazing. Right? To have placed the name of Guyana on Mount Roraima. That's correct. Right? Um, establish our claims, at least, on the international law. Right. Right? Whereby, as a sovereign nation, we certainly can contend that we are Roraima. Correct. And now, you've... Fortify it with your company, Roraima. That's correct. That's, that's a vision. Correct. That's correct. Okay. I, li I like I like to say sometimes that maybe the name Roraima after my company. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, yeah. so after that night, then we we I remember this was the second night we were going to sleep in Mount Roraima. Like Miles said, it was quiet. It was deafening silence. There was not a sound. And um, the next morning, we. Um, when we got up, the weather was fantastic, and we called on the HF radio to get the helicopter to get us because we had to get off the mountain, get back to Philippi, get our team, and fly those planes back to be overhead, George, at 10 o'clock on Independence Day.
to link up at the same time when, when the hug was going to happen. So we had to get back overhead the city when everybody was on the road and holding hands across across the country. And that was amazing because we, we the helicopter came, got us off the mountain, we landed at, um, at Philippi and then we got all of the people of Philippi to, to had, we, we had a big hug across the, the village of Philippi. And the people were so excited to be part of this national, um, this national strategy to, to foster national unity and love for each other and so on. And, um, and you know, I wanted to reflect at this time though on, on you know, national service. I, I, am, I am a big believer that national service is an amazing organization that helped, that helped form me and cultured me. Um, and really, National Service had a, had a slogan that they were going to create the new Guyana man. And I, I would say, even if I say it so egotistically myself, that I am a product of National Service and probably a product of what this new Guyana man should be like. Um, in the sense that of, of knowing your country, loving your fellow man, you know, um, and, and living your life every day with a social conscience of how do you give back to your country? How do you, how do you, how do you contribute to national development? And as we reflect on these things, you know, uh, my, myself and my son Jerry and my, and my other son Kevin and, and Debbie would sit and we would talk about Roraima. You know, we would often say, it is not, it is not what we do that matters. Because pe other people fly planes, other people have hotels. It is not how we do what we do. Um, because you fly the plane the same way. But for us, it is why we do what we do. And we save lives. We create jobs. We contribute to national development. We contribute to hinterland development, you know, every day. And if there's anything that gives me an amazing amount of satisfaction, is being able to contribute to national development, contribute to my fellow Guyanese, saving their lives in our medical evacuation uh, uh, services at night. And you know, people say to you, they will say, well, does the Ministry of Health pay you for this? Sure, the Ministry of Health would pay, but the money is not the issue. They might pay six months afterwards, that is not the issue. Because nobody could really pay a pilot. Captain Alvin Clark, who, um, who is now our current medical evacuation pilot, when Miles was here, Miles and myself did many, many, many vacs. I did many of them over the years. But nobody could pay you. With the take amount of a plane, that you save. No, 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 to take, a, yeah. to take a plane into that jungle at night without lights and to land in these runways with flambos in the, in the, in the, in the mountains and in, in short runways with obstacles and so on. So people like Captain Alvin Clark is, is a guy and he's a hero. Mm -hmm. And he would do what he do every day. Um, and it is why he does it. Why we do what we do is what is important. And I just want to reflect on that as we as we reflect here on independence and the on our forty ninth independent anniversary. That Guyanese um, the issue of, of giving meaning to that to, to that that phrase that John F. Kennedy is not is not what your country could do for you, but what you could do for your country. Really. You know, everybody talk it. But really and truly, how could you live it? How do you live it every day and give back to your country? Um, and you know what? Your country will give back to you. Correct. But I think some people have it wrong sometimes. They always say, what, what could the country do for me? And I think if you do for your country, your country do, do a lot for you. And both, my, both Miles and myself are, 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 are army officers. We, we, we came through the army. The army did so much for young men like us. And they're still doing a lot of stuff, a lot for young people today. Um, and it's, it's fascinating what your country could do for you if you could just concentrate on what you could do for your country. And so at the end of the, of the expedition, so we came back and we got over the city at 10 o'clock. And then um, about two days afterwards, we had the first cocktail that was going to happen at Carol Lodge. Carol Lodge was now opening for the first time. And we hosted a, a cocktail, uh, a reception um, to acknowledge the, the, Mon the Mount Orion expedition. And so we invited everybody that night, all the private sector leaders, the labor, President Jagan was there and President Height was there. And um, it was quite an amazing night. But I'll show you something that happened there that night. Um, could you play that back again? I like that video. There's a, no, there's a video actually, play the video here. Um, and um, so we got everybody in the room after congratulating ourselves um, open the video. We got everybody 
It's playing from here. Um, and invited the two gentlemen David. to hold hands. So at Carol House this evening, we had um, what was a rather historic moment um, with President Chedi Chad Chadden um, holding hands um, with um, the former president and now opposition leader Desmond Cotton in what was in fact a symbol of unity. And, and you know, so we talk about unity <laughs> and reaching across that divide and touching each other. And um, that to me um, ended the Mount Rhyme expedition and ended our efforts to bring, to raise the morale, to, to really put meaning to national unity in, in 1996 to mark our 30th uh, independence anniversary. And we, I believe both My Miles and myself, and all our support team, Debbie and Joan, and all the other people below uh, who, who helped Miles, um, we, it was a fantastic effort, and I believe that we contributed to making that particular anniversary very, very significant in Guyana's history, and particularly now to set the challenge for either my son Jerry here, um, and to go back to Mount Oraima for the 50th anniversary of Guyana's independence, and put back Guyana's name in its rightful place on that trilateral marker. Every day it annoys me. Every day it annoys me that we haven't done this for the last 19 years. And um, every time I talk about it, I get very upset. That as a nation, we don't pay attention to the things that are so important for nation building. You know, I see the work that is happening at the Independence Monument, and I'm so, uh, so impressed. Um, Colonel Larry London, is a, is a, he was my commanding officer in the, in the Air Corps. He's an amazing officer, and he is always the kind of person who, when you wanted to get something done, he was the man that got it done, and yeah. got it done with a high standard. And um, when, I, when I found out that he was going to do this, I passed there this afternoon, and I was just blown away with, with, with mm -hmm. that monument. I remember as a young boy, going there and, 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 and marveling at it. And we, we just allow it to, to wither away. And symbols of nationhood is what I believe National Service was able to t um, teach us the issues, uh, issues of our, our national anthem, is the pledge, you know, our, our coat of arms. People must remember those things, must know what the color of the flag is and, and the meaning behind our, 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 our coat of arms and, um, and, and our national symbols. I, I would really love to see our national symbols restored and to be, um, and to give them the kind of respect. I would love to see GDF officers there 24 hours a day guarding our national, our national monuments, like happened in China, like <laughs> happened in other parts of the world, where you have a change of guard that happens um, and, and tourists could go and look at it and, and, and understand that this is, just a, this is just not a nation of people or a country of people, but a country of people that are proud of the things that make, up, make, us, a, make us a nation. Captain, I can see that passion, you know, in your speech. You, you, you've really, you're touching me really with, with what you're outlining here, what you have done. I think is truly remarkable. Um, it's amazing to know our vast interland and the role that our military has played in protecting the sovereignty of our country. Um, you yourself, I think it's significant that you were able to go up there and inscribe on Mount Rhyme of itself, this is Guyana, not a blade of grass. Exactly. You know, <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are nation building concepts that live with you and as you speak it brought back so many memories I think that it's commendable especially at this time of our anniversary I think the fact that you have brought two opposing leaders Dr. Chedi Jagan and President Desmond Oik together in harmony is very symbolic at this time when we're speaking of national unity perhaps I would suggest that you can do the same, <laughs> right? Of bringing together Brigadier David Granger and our ex-president um, Donald Ramatar. I think this would be very, very significant 
for Guyana moving forward. Um, however, it can be done. I think Captain Gavai, you're probably the person. No, no, but you know, you know, national unity is easy yeah. to talk. Yeah. Um, how do you translate the talk into action? Is by reaching across the divide and mm -hmm. touching, touching each other. And I think that is the challenge. We must yeah. also give our leaders to reach across the divide. We are Guyanese. You know, you talk about opposing leaders. I see them as two Guyanese leaders. Yeah. And they're not opposing leaders. They may be on different political parties, but they are Guyanese leaders. And there are thousands and thousands of Guyanese that look at these men for leadership. And these men must provide leadership and must bring our people together by both of them getting together. Mm -hmm. I think that is the challenge. Marge, you wanted to add anything to this conversation here, boy? No, I think it's, it's time for uh, Diana to move forward. Put aside race. Diana needs to move forward. We've been in very dark places, and it's time to get ahead. And um, President Granger and the former president need to get together and encourage the Guyanese people to move forward. You know, I think it's very significant. Uh, Captain, you have not only demonstrated that commitment but even in Roraima as a company I think it was a great vision not only a nation building but in terms of the economic impact the creation of employment yes. to the masses of Guyana right now we need to create more employment so as an entrepreneur as a visionary as I would refer you to I think this is you're truly a product of what Guyana would like to see its citizens accomplish um, I commend you on this. Um, sitting here, I've learned so much about the history of Guyana, about the history of, of independence, and I think in terms of the recognition and sovereignty of the nation, we ought to instill in our younger folks this sense of patriotism, this sense of pride that is so much lacking today. And I, I'm just proud to be associated with something like that. You see the three yeah. components of, yeah. of national development, uh, economic development, yeah. uh, nation building, and human development. I think every leader that ever crossed uh, the office of the president um, had to grapple with how do you balance the tree? How do you, how do you decide what percentage of GDP growth do you put back into human development and what do you put back into economic development so that you don't have people left behind? Um, and more particularly, how, why, why do you do those things with economic development and human development? How do you inculcate in, in our young people the love for Guyana? love for the soil, love for our national symbols, love for our national, the, 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 our, our pledge, our national anthem, and so on. And um, I think, if I would say one thing that we've lost over the years, um, and some people think it's all corny and this, well, let me say it to you, maybe because um, people who have served in the military, Jerry uh, as a, an, a, 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 a Canadian Air Force officer before he came back home, myself, Miles, um, the issues of nation, of nation, of nation building, um, all the symbols of, of national, of nation building, the flag, um, you know, the, the coat of arms, the pledge, our national monuments are very, very important components to our country and it should be for every individual person, every teacher and every parent should remind, should be reminded of their, of their, of their responsibility to, to, um, remind their children or guide their children not only about economic development but also about love for country and what could you do for your country. What do you say, Jerry? I agree 100%. Uh, um, when you and Captain Williams or I call him Uncle Milo get together, it's always fantastic to hear the stories and hear the perspective um, that you guys have to offer. I mean, you guys had an extensive military career, um, you know, he, you know, you got to fly, you know, amazing aircraft and, and, and assist the, the hinterland community so much so that when we fly together, sometimes we land in some middle of nowhere airstrips and there's always someone who goes, hey, Captain Gavaya, I remember you. You showed up here and, you know, um, you saved my life or you saved my friend's life or something like that. So that's the opportunity you had while serving your country. And I know that um, Miles Williams, he being a special forces officer, as well as a, as a military pilot, he has had many instances of, of the same, um, where he you know, put his life and everything on the line for his countrymen. And that, that's an honor that very few people actually get to undertake. 
um, and then put it into practice. So, so these two gentlemen, when they get together, it's always a fantastic, not only history lesson, but also a, a lesson on patriotism and, and service to your country. And um, especially being one of the, the younger people in, in the country these days, um, and I think it has to do with young people all over the world, because it's something that, that was, was hard to build in Canada even, that when people heard the national anthem, you should stop whatever you're doing and pay attention. If you see the flag raising, you should stop what you're doing and pay attention. And these are lessons that generally the public don't adhere to. They hear the national anthem on the radio and they continue doing what they're doing. Whereas a military person or a person who has served their country in some capacity, they stop what they're doing and it's almost a reflex, right? And they don't sit there and continue writing, they'll stand up and, and pay the homage to this flag because um, whatever flag you're from, I mean, I served in the Canadian military. Um, I never got a chance to serve in the GDF um, as yet, let's, let's say that much anyway. Um, however, whatever country you serve, whatever country you, you belong to, you don't have to be in the military to respect your country and respect um, the nationhood that, that many generations of men and women before you have fought and bled for to make sure that your country is, is where it is today. And I think that that's something that we can definitely work on in our, as we're coming up to our inauguration tomorrow. I mean, it's 49 years, we're a young country. Um, and I say we because I always, you know, uh, connected with my Guyanese heritage. I mean, I, I, you know, I was born in Canada, but I grew up many of my formative years right here. Um, I got to, you know, when I was young, it was always fun um, when dad or mom or even Miles were coming in from a medevac in the middle of the night. We would be woken up at 11 o'clock and we're going to go put lights on the runway for them to come home and land. And we would get to see firsthand their servitude, not even after they're out of the military. They, the, the, the principle of serving your country um, was strong with them and it's strong with both me and my brother. I mean, it's, it's almost in the, in the DNA of Roraima, it's in our DNA as a family, that serving our country and serving our fellow countrymen is, is you know, it's above everything else. Yeah, just to add from what you're saying, Jerry, of course I agree with every bit of what you're saying. Uh, but I think that discipline too must be inculcated within the school system. Oh, very, you know, perhaps within the family unit, then the school system, that type of concept, that type of discipline, nation building, must be cultivated within the, the total system, rather than just, say, the military. We can't wait until we get to the military to acquire that type of, of discipline or nation building. Right. right. So I would like to commend everyone who have listened to the program. I'd like to wish everybody a very happy uh, independence. Right. Um, I'm very privileged that I'm in the company of two distinguished gentlemen, both being pilots. Both three. Being, oh, sorry, three. <laughs> <laughs> right. All three being pilots. All three being military officers. Um, I've learned a lot especially the historical aspect of of independence and I would definitely would like to continue my association with but I want to I want as we wrap up this this yeah. this uh, program I wanted to share a story yeah it's an interesting story myself and Anjari uh, we landed at uh, runway in the Pakarima mountains uh, called uh, uh, Parmakatoi mm. and um, while we're there um, the nurse in the area reminded me of a story that happened 35 years ago. And I remember this very clearly. I was flying one day with the Skyvan going to Lethem. And I had 18 soldiers in the plane and we were going to do the changeover of the guard at Lethem. And I heard on the HF radio, this person screaming in the radio that this person is going to die. You know, they were calling for this medivac and nobody is coming. And I um, cut the power for the aircraft and descended down through the clouds and landed this runway. Um, and this was a very short runway. So I landed with 18 soldiers, but I couldn't take off with 18 soldiers. So they knew that I'd have to shuttle them to, to Cato to get them out. But anyway, so I landed there and I came out of the plane with 18 soldiers and we walked to find a nurse and I said, what's going on here? Um, where's the person? She said, Captain, I'm so glad you came, but unfortunately the person died. And I said, what do you mean the person died? She said, well, he's not really dead yet, but the family, um, the Armenian family, he was, he, had a, he was bitten by a snake in his eye. 
and his head was really big. And because they were waiting so long for this medivac and it couldn't come, they took him down the mountain to this valley in a little hut and they were all sitting around him and the idea was that if he was going to die, they want him to die there with them. So I was sometimes a little maverick myself. And when she told me that I should take me to where he is. So they took me down this hill and the 18 soldiers followed me down the hill. And we got there and I saw the hut and all the, the, the family was sitting around the hut. So I said, where is the man? And they said, well, he's in the hut, but the family don't want you to go inside. And of course, I had no manners. So I went into the hut, put on my flashlight, and it was very dark, and there was a guy lying on, the, on this, on the ground, on a, on, a, on a hammock cloth, and his head was really big and black um, from, the, from the snake bite, but he was breathing. And I said, nurse, is this, could this guy live? And she said, yes. So I told her, so just pick him up. And the family got up, really upset with me. So I said, pick him up and take him back to the airplane. So um, we took him back to the plane and the family were away because they figured he, would, he should die. The guy was 20 years old. So I left the soldiers in the ground, put him in the plane and flew back to Ogle. One, and one hour, 15 minutes back to Ogle, landed Ogle, deposited him with the military ambulance and went back to, to my mission. Never heard from this guy for all these years. And much to my surprise, this guy came up, this person came up to me and um, he had a lady with four or five children and, and some grandchildren. And he came, he said, Captain, do you remember me? And I said, no, I don't. He's, but I, he, is, he was blind in the one eye and he said, I'm the person that you saved that day. He said, I lived and I now have my wife and my children and my grandchildren and thank you very much for life. Mm -hmm. And that to me, no money could pay me for that. But you also fly um, Christmas Day all yeah, year. Yeah, but I mean, this is just a story. Yeah. This is just a story that happened and is very important. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, first of all, guys, I would like to thank our guests in, um, this evening, Patrick Triumph again. Thank you for showing up. Thank you. And uh, gracing us again with, with an intriguing conversation. Uh, Captain Miles Williams, thank you for joining us on Skype. Um, it's always a pleasure talking to you. All the way from Miami. Miami. All the way from Miami. From Naples, Florida. Naples, right. Um, and thank you again for, for joining us. Your insight and your experience is definitely something that, that we can all learn from. And uh, absolutely, Dad, th or Captain Gavaya, let's try to be a little bit professional here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for coming out. I mean, I get to hear these stories since I was uh, a, a young boy growing up, and it still doesn't bore me today. And, and it's fantastic, and I think it's important for, for more people to hear these type of stories. And these type of stories don't only rest with, um, with these two individuals. They rest with every nurse, every doctor, every police officer, every firefighter, every paramedic, every pilot. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. The service to, the, to one person's country is, is, is paramount. And we should really take the time to go and thank these people. It doesn't have to be military officers or military personnel alone, but anyone who donates their time, energy, and sacrifice for their country is someone who should be commended, and especially as our 49th um, yeah, Independence Day is coming up tomorrow and our inauguration of the new um, President Brigadier. Brigadier retired President David Granger is going to be um, inaugurated tomorrow. I think it's a very important time for all of Guyanese to come together um, celebrate our unity, but also remember that there's people out there that while we sleep warm in our beds, they're out there making sure that we're safe and people in the far reaches are safe as well. So I want to say thank you all for watching, and I hope you guys will tune in next month where we're going to be talking about a little bit of something different, a little bit of something more fun. And um, But for, for right now, guys, thank you for tuning in. My name is Jerry Gavaya again, and I'll see you tomorrow at the inauguration. Elegance, words which epitomize the Roraima residence in a boutique hotel that offers free internet and complimentary continental breakfast. Our Point Nature Resort, nestled in our rainforest for that perfect day or overnight getaway, fun day, retreat, or wedding. Roraima Executive Lounge at our International Airport, 
offers complimentary snacks, beverages, and internet while you await your flight. Roraima Group, Guyana's only complete circle of travel and tourism services.